Hi and welcome back. Today I'm going to be finishing up the uh, wing dividers that I started last time. The last bit of forging that I need to do to the legs is to forge weld a piece of hardenable steel to the inside faces of each leg. This is not absolutely necessary if you're just planning on using the dividers to measure things, but if you plan on scribing lines onto steel, then a hard tip is really necessary because uh, otherwise you'll be sharpening the tips all the time. I've already prepped everything and as you can see the piece that I'm laminating to the dividers is just sitting on top of the leg and I've managed to knock it a little bit as I was taking it out of the fire. This isn't a problem if you've taken the time to heat up everything properly. You will have the time to get the two pieces to stick. You're not going to be able to do any heavy hammering, but you will be able to get them to behave themselves until you can get them back in the fire and properly continue the forge welding process. I found over the years that it's really important to just take your time and relax while you're forge welding. Uh, if the conditions are right and you've prepped everything correctly, it's going to weld. If you've missed something and something is not right, then rushing it isn't going to solve anything. It, the two pieces just are not going to weld. So the first heat, and this goes especially when I'm doing a drop tong weld, the first heat is always just to get the two pieces to stick together, put them back in the fire, and then continue forge welding. I don't try to get everything done in one heat. And as you've just witnessed, if the surfaces are clean and the flux is still active, you can get the two pieces to stick at some pretty incredibly low temperatures. At the end of each forge welding heat, I will wire brush off all of the old flux that isn't active anymore and apply more flux. You don't have to apply a lot once the two pieces are stuck together because you're, at this point you're basically just trying to create a neat looking weld and have everything close up around the edges. So just apply a little bit of flux, put it back in the fire and just repeat the process. The next step is to pin both halves of the dividers together. I start by drilling a hole that's slightly smaller than the pin that I'm going to be using and then I prep the pin by grinding a slight taper to the tip and I use that as a drift to make the hole exactly the right size. The final step while the hinge area is still hot is to have a look and correct any distortion that might have happened while you were drifting the hole. On this pair of dividers the rivet head is actually going to be made of two pieces. The pin is going to be riveted over a heavy washer that's going to be forming the bulk of the rivet head. I usually make these washers by drilling a hole in the end of a round bar that's you know the right size for the uh, hinge area that I'm working with but I don't have a bar that's big enough so I have one that's slightly smaller and I'm thinking I'm going to be able to just forge them flat and get them to spread out wide enough to cover the full width of the divider hinge area. I have drilled a smaller hole in the end of the bar before cutting off the washers and I'm going to be using this hole basically just to keep the washer even as I'm forging it out. I don't want to spread one side of the washer more than the other uh, so if I keep that hole basically in the center of the washer everything is going to work out fine. The last thing that I'll do is drill out the, uh, the hole to the final size.
Here you can see that I'm ready to set the rivets. I've hammered the washers onto the end of the pin and I've also cut away the piece of metal that was joining the double leg uh, side of the uh, dividers. The rivet's going to be holding everything together now so I don't need that link anymore. So here you can clearly see that I have three separate legs and they're starting to look like a pair of dividers. The final shape of the rivet head is done by filing or grinding. I prefer to file because you can get into tighter spaces and uh, you can see what you're doing. But if you're comfortable with a grinder you can certainly use it to take away 90% of the material that you need to remove to shape the rivet head. Once all the shaping is done to the rivet, you will need to reheat the ends of the dividers um, to free up the hinge joint. The riveting process would have locked everything together and by heating it and then slowly working the joint loose, you'll be able to create a very smooth working hinge joint. Here I have a drawing that shows me the exact shape of the curved arm that I need to add to one of the divider legs. The cross at the lower right is the actual center of the rivet and the center line of the three curved lines is the middle of the uh, slot that I'm going to be cutting out into the legs of the dividers. So I need to shape a bar that fits in between these two outside lines. I'm going to be using a piece of round bar to forge this leg. So the first thing that I did was just bent it cold as closely as I can to match the pattern. I just bent it at the vise, nothing complicated. And then I'll be hammering the piece flat. If I'm careful to hammer very evenly, the overall shape of the piece won't change hardly at all. This is a much simpler process than forging the piece flat first and then trying to bend it on edge to conform to the pattern. Now that I have the forging done, I can cool the piece off and go back to doing the final shaping cold. So at this point your shape should be almost there and it's just a process of comparing it to the drawing and identifying areas that need to be corrected. If the curve needs to be tightened up, support the outside edges of the curve and hammer on the inside. 
Here I'm hammering into the dish of a swage block, but you can support the outside edges with anything. You can use the jaws of your vise, uh, the open end of a large piece of pipe, or you know a large chain link. You know anything that supports the outside edges and gives you the room to hammer in the center. If you need to open up the curve, then you need to do the opposite. You need to support the outside edges of the inside of the curve and hammer the outside of the curved section to open it up. Then go back to the drawing, see uh, if there's another area that needs to be corrected and you just repeat the process as often as you need to. to get the curve as close as you can to the pattern. It doesn't have to be machine precision. The basic arc of the curve just has to be right. This curved section needs to pass through both of the divider legs and I have that location marked out here and I'm just going to be drilling out and cutting away the material the way I always do. And the final fitting will be done with a file. So here I'm a little bit further along. I have the curved section so it fits inside the dividers, but now I need to make sure that it's in the correct location in the dividers. So I have a smaller set of dividers set from the exact center of the pivot point to the exact center of the center line of this curved section. If the curve section is in the correct location, this set of dividers, as I swing it out, should follow the center line exactly. If the dividers drift off of the center line of the curve section, then I need to move the curve section over so that it aligns up with the dividers. Once I have these two arcs matching up perfectly, I'm going to use a Sharpie to mark the exact location of where this curve section needs to be in the dividers. Next I'm going to be using a pair of locking pliers to make sure that the uh, curve section stays in the correct position. Next I'm going to clamp the pliers in the vise. So this allows me to work the dividers and make the final adjustments to the shape. By opening and closing the legs I'm going to be able to identify areas that are binding against the curved section. In these areas I may need to adjust the thickness of the curved section or I may need to adjust the outside edges of the curved section. You should be able to see fine scratch lines on the surface of the metal that give you the location of where to file. If those are hard to see you can use a marker pen and you know that'll help uh, define the location as well. The important thing, as always, is to take your time. Don't remove too much material at once. Uh, remember, this is metal. You know, one thousandth of an inch might seem like a quarter of an inch. So take your time and just remove what you need to to get the arms to work smoothly. Now that I'm done adjusting the curved section and I know that it's going to work in the dividers, I'm ready to pin the uh, curved section to one of the divider legs. It's quite common in these type of dividers to have a large decorative nail head forged into the end of the curved section. and That's what I'm working on here. I'm actually forging down that short section of metal that I was hanging on to with the locking pliers. The line that I had marked with a sharpie has been replaced with a couple of deep center punch marks that I can find when the metal is hot and I'm lining that up with the top of the jaws and just upsetting the metal down into a huge mass that I can use to forge that nail head. When I feel that I have enough material I slide the curve section back into the dividers and I use the actual dividers as a nail header to shape the head. The final step is to actually pin the curved section to the dividers with a flush rivet.
I'm going to be making the screw that locks the divider settings out of a thicker piece of bar stock. I'm going to start by cutting in a square pin that's a little bit larger than I need for the screw that I'm after. I'm going to be using a pair of dial calipers that are locked into the setting that I need for the outside diameter of the stock for the thread that I'm cutting. So I'm going to start by making sure that the square pin is exactly the right size and then from there I'm going to start knocking off the four corners to start creating an octagon and I'm going to make sure that those flat faces are also the exact right size and then from there it's pretty simple to just create a round pin that's very very close to what you need. Now that I have the pin threaded, I'm going to go ahead and shape the rest of the screw. I'm going to be leaving the uh, screw on the bar for as long as possible. That extra material really makes it easier to uh, hang on to while it's in the vise. I should be able to shape the entire profile of the screw with just a little tiny attachment point that I'm going to need to clean up when all is said and done. So that's usually the best way to approach a small project like this. This piece of sheet metal was just inserted under the piece to keep it from spinning around in the vice jaws. It can be anything, this just happened to be what was handy. I apologize for this shot, it's a little confusing. It does look like I'm threading the divider leg as well as the end of the curved section, but I'm not. The, the curved section just happens to be sitting just outside the uh, divider leg, but at this angle it does look like I'm threading both of them together. Now that I have everything assembled and it's all working the way that it should, I'm going to take the time to grind everything to the final shape, put a file finish on everything, and then I'm going to throw it back in the fire to blacken the entire surface. I'm going to be leaving the forged finish on the final piece, but you will be able to see the distinctive file um, you know, finish underneath the forged scale. So when it's oiled up, it'll uh, look really great. So at this point, it's just a matter of systematically heating it up from one end to the other.
I am starting at the hinge end because I want to finish with the divider points because I need to heat treat those. So they're going to be the last things out of the fire. I'm using canola oil as a quench. When you're quenching an oil, you have to be careful. It cools things down so much slower than water. You really have to leave it in the oil like, 10 times longer than you would with water to make sure that it's really cold and the heat treat is set. Once the points are fully hardened, you'll see me turn the uh, dividers around and quench the other end. This is not part of the heat treating. This is just a provide the oil finish that I want over the entire piece. After I've wiped everything down, I throw the dividers in an oven that's set to 440 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's my oven. You, you know, yours may differ, but basically you're looking for this ready brown transferring to a peacock blue purple color. That'll soften the uh, tips enough to make them flexible so they'll take a lot of abuse, but they're still going to hold up very well when you're scribing metal. So the dividers I just finished are done. They're totally ready to use. Uh, this is just a little add-on that I've included to answer a couple of questions that I received from people who are wondering what stock size to use to make the smaller dividers that I used as a pattern for the larger dividers that I just finished. So as usual, I started off by doing the math, and uh, this time the math was too close to call. Uh, you know, a half-inch bar, which is what I assumed I would use to forge the smaller dividers, was, was right. It was just the right amount of material if I could get all of the material. But I know that as I'm cross-painting, I'm going to lose some to the length, and I'm not going to have any practical way of gaining that back, pushing it back where it belongs. So... I decided to just run a couple of test pieces to see if that was right or not. And this is basically the results. I don't need to forge out the entire you know, set of dividers to be able to figure this out. I just need to forge the two areas of concern. So I'm forging the hinge area and the boss that I'm going to be using to anchor the curved section. By looking at those finished dimensions, it'll be obvious which bar I need to use. So here are the two samples that I made up. The one on the bottom is made with the half inch square bar and it's undersized. I had to thin down the thickness of the material far too much to get the width that I needed for the hinge area. So it's not going to work. You would have enough material to make a simple pair of dividers using a lap joint, but to create a three-leafed uh, design the way the original was, it would be extremely difficult to cut that into this thin profile. The other sample I made is with a 5 8 round bar, which is, from a volume point of view, the next step up in terms of common bar sizes that are available. And the overall dimensions of this sample match up exactly with the measurements that you need to forge the sample pair of dividers that I used uh, as a model for this project. So hopefully that answers your questions for now. Um, I do plan on making a lot more dividers. Um, I really like dividers as I've probably mentioned before and uh, this is a a pair that I needed right now so I just decided to film it as I was forging it. It's not really a, uh, a, a pattern video that you can go out and use to make an exact copy of what I made today. It just basically gives you an idea of how I work through the process because this is the first pair of wing dividers that I've made so there were a few questions I needed to answer for myself. I do plan on making other videos on uh, making dividers and they will be more complete with dimensions and more specific instructions but this just gives you an idea of um, you know how I work through the process hi I'm Dennis and thanks for watching if you have any questions you can contact me by using the email address that I have shown here if you like the channel and the work that I'm doing please consider becoming a patron Every dollar you contribute will bring me one step closer to being able to produce videos full time.